Good morning. I'm Suzanne Borden, Moment Magazine's Zoominar producer, and I'd like to welcome you to today's program, Becoming Dr. Ruth, with Ruth K. Westheimer and Tova Felshu. Today's Zoominar is being recorded. Please type your questions in the Q&A box, and we'll try to get to as many as possible at the end of the session. Following the program, please visit Moment's website where you can subscribe to the magazine and be sure to register for our Zoominar tomorrow, She's Gone, Shedding Light on Domestic Violence. And join us again next Tuesday for The Uyghur in China, An Inconvenient Genocide with journalists Tom Jelton and Robert Siegel. Now for today's program. Dr. Ruth K. Westheimer is best known for having pioneered talking about sex on radio and television, but that is only a small part of her rich and diversified life. Born in Germany, Dr. Ruth was sent to Switzerland via the kinder transport at the age of 10 to escape the Holocaust. At the age of 17, she went to then Palestine, where she joined the Haganah, the Israeli freedom fighters, and was trained to be a sniper. Dr. Ruth later moved to Paris and studied at the Sorbonne. After making her way to the United States, she obtained her master's degree in sociology for the new, from the New School, and many years later, a doctorate of education from Teachers College, Columbia University. Dr. Ruth's work at Planned Parenthood led her to study human sexuality under Dr. Helen Singer Kaplan at New York Hospital Cornell University Medical Center, where she became an adjunct associate professor. Subsequently, she taught courses at various institutions of higher learning, including Princeton and Yale. She currently is an adjunct professor at Columbia's Teacher College and continues to lecture worldwide. This past April, Dr. Ruth received an honorary doctorate for Israel's, from Israel's Ben-Gurion University of the Negev. She also raised $130,000 for scholarships in psychology at Ben-Gurion University for both Israeli and Bedouin women. Tova Felshu is a six-time Emmy and Tony nominee and has been awarded three honorary doctorates of humane letters. For her theater work, she has won four drama desks, four outer critics circle, three drama logs, the Obi, the Theater World, the Helen Hayes, and Lucille Lortel Awards for Best Actress. She has also received Moment Magazine's Creativity Award. Tova is a playwright, concert artist, and author. Her first memoir, Lilyville, Mother, Daughter, and Other Roles I've Played, was released earlier this year. Her TV credits include Holocaust, Law and Order, The Walking Dead, and Crazy Ex-Girlfriend. Films include Kissing Jessica Stein, A Walk on the Moon, and The Idol Maker. Broadway roles include Yenta, Gold's Balcony, Pippin, and more. Tova has recently portrayed Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg in Sisters-in-Law, as well as the infamous Queen of Mean Leona Hemsley in Tova in Is Leona. Tova currently stars as Dr. Ruth K. Westheimer in Becoming Dr. Ruth, which opened in previews this past weekend at the Museum of Jewish Heritage, a living memorial to the Holocaust in New York City. Joining Dr. Ruth and Tova today is Nadine Epstein, an award-winning journalist and author. She has been the editor-in-chief and CEO of Moment Magazine since 2004 and is the founder and executive director of the Center for Creative Change. Nadine is the editor of Ellie Wiesel, An Extraordinary Life and Legacy. Her most recent book is RBG's Brave and Brilliant Women, 33 Jewish Women to Inspire Everyone, which she wrote in collaboration with the late Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Please welcome Dr. Ruth K. Westheimer, Tova Felshu, and Nadine Epstein. Very nice introduction. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, uh, hello. By the way, Tova is running a little late, so we, I have a few questions that I'm going to be act, asking Dr. Ruth. And Dr. Ruth, you have lived such an amazing life with such, with such strong spirit and so much resiliency. And I want to ask you a few questions about your early life that I think not everyone knows about. And I know some of these are in the play. But, but what was your life like before you were 10 years old, when you were okay. growing up in Germany? All right, very important question, because my first years of life were wonderful. I grew up in an Orthodox Jewish family in Frankfurt am Main, and I was an only child, <laughs> and I had a grandmother, the mother of my father, living with us, and she had nothing else to do take care of me. Uh, 
<laughs> and what is very important right now to tell you all, I did a study following those children who left Germany with me, who were six years in the orphanage in Switzerland. And we'll talk later a little more about then Palestine and Israel. But I did a study following those children. And what's very important for moment magazine readers, none of us fell by the wayside. None became suicidal. None became clinically depressed. And that's because we were all in a loving household the first years of our lives, the first socialization that carried us through some of the terrible happenings like becoming orphans. So the first moment reader is very important to tell every parent how, and grandparent how important it is to be very attentive uh, to the early years of childhood. That's a very important message for all of us everywhere in the world. Um, so tell me what it was like to be on the kinder transport. That's a big change. You're suddenly on a, on a so, train. You're on your way to Switzerland. Give us a little sense of what it's like. Okay, so in 1938, after the night of broken glass, some people call it Kristallnacht, my father was taken to a labor camp. There were no concentration camps yet. And um, I was an only child and a postcard came. Carola, that was my name then. That's why my middle initial is always K. Carola has to join the group of children who are permitted to come to Switzerland uh, so that he, my father, could come back to Frankfurt. I did not want to leave. I was an only child. I had 13 dolls. I had roller skates. I had no choice. So in my case, my parents gave me life twice. Once when I was born and once when they brought me to the railroad station in Frankfurt am Main to join the group of children who were permitted to go to Switzerland. There was a conference in Evian. Not enough is being talked about that conference. In 1938, just before the war, let's save German Jewry. The conference in Evian failed miserably. Nothing happened except the cry, let's at least take the children so the parents can prepare to immigrate someplace. England, despite the facts that there were dark clouds on the horizon, took 10,000 Jewish children. Holland, Belgium, and France, and Switzerland, 300 each. If I had been on the group, Holland, Belgium, or France, I would not be alive. These children did not make it. The group in, to Switzerland, 300 children did make it. And um, so this, this was an important uh, decision, and I'm very grateful to Switzerland for having uh, taken me and the other children uh, for the duration of World War II. What was it like on the train? What did you do on the train? When you get on the so, train, what do you feel and what happens and what, do you, what okay. are you doing for those, those hours on the train? So when my father was picked up by the Nazis, I looked out the window in Frankfurt and I saw the truck. I couldn't see what was in it because it was covered. But uh, my father saw me at the window despite the fact that he must have been horrified. Uh, before entering the truck, he turned around, waved and smiled. I did the same thing on the train to Switzerland. I looked out at my mother and grandmother and I forced myself not to cry, but to wave and to smile so that they should have an easier time. As it turned out, as many of you know, I never saw my uh, parents or grandmother or the other grandparents from Wiesenfeld, from a village ever again. But my father did come back to Frankfurt until they were deported. So your father escaped? 
Oh, your father, your father came back, but he was later killed. No, my father came back and then was killed. And oh. I went to Yad Vashem. All of you at Moment Magazine have to know about Yad Vashem in Jerusalem because they have the list of people with their birth date and with their day, with the date of their death. Very important. And I am, I, I have my father's uh, name and his birth date and 1900 and my grandmother and the other relatives next to my mother. It says the word in German, verschollen. Verschollen is a terrible word. Verschollen means disappeared. Nobody knew. So now, and you are all witnesses to that moment magazine. Now there's a play, Becoming Dr. Ruth. And Tova felt you place me. And the play is dedicated to my entire family who were killed, who did not make it out of the Holocaust. That's why I'm on the board of the, of the uh, trustees of the Museum of Jewish Heritage. And let me tell you something very fast. Tova, who plays me, is fabulous. Please, all of you fast, come to New York. You don't have to stay overnight. You can go back to Washington uh, that same day. Either come for an evening and go back or uh, be careful, wear the mask. And she is fabulous. I hope she hears that. Our readers are everywhere. So they can fly in from wherever to go see the play. Right. So, um, so what was the orphanage? I know you ended up in an orphanage in Switzerland. And what was that like? You're 10 oh, years old, you're, you've come from, you've been oh, the center of attention in your family. Um, you have this beautiful family life and now you're in an orphanage. What, what was it like? So the, it wasn't an orphanage yet. At the time, it was a children's home for kids uh. who could not be at home. Like Swiss kids whose parents were either traveling or were divorced or, or sick or something. In, we came there, the whole group of us, and I did a study following each one. I told you about that already. And um, so we had one teacher for 40 children of different intellectual capacity and different ages, because they did not let us girls go to high school. There was a wonderful high school in the village of Aydin, where that children's home war time was located, but they didn't let girls go there. I have all of you at Moment Magazine, I want you to know that I have a Swiss household diploma of a Swiss maid. When I'm not Dr. Ruth anymore, I can come to your house, I can show you my diploma, but I'll tell you right away, I don't do windows. So. Fortunately, we had a teacher, Ignaz Mandel, who was um, very, very devoted. He made us write diaries, which I still have today. And the, uh, the play is partly based on those diaries. And Tova Felchow is fabulous in that, <laughs> in that play. So I want to repeat. I'll do it a few more times. Come to the Museum of Jewish Heritage in memory of my family, the play Becoming Dr. Ruth. So this is the first time you've already, you've already um, met and encountered, you know, dis discrimination, persecution because you're Jewish. But now when you're in this, when you're in Switzerland, you're facing gender discrimination. How do you feel when you don't get to go to high school? What are you, what are you thinking? Okay, this is why I'm so delighted about the scholarship at Ben Gurion University, because Bedouin women also were not permitted until recently to get higher education. And for me, education, my father taught me, education is the most important thing. Nobody can take it from you. That's why you, Moment Magazine, are listening to us. That's why you are learning. And this is what I did my entire life of 
of talking about things. It happened to be sex. I didn't know I would be a sex therapist. I didn't know the New York Times yesterday called me renowned. So I didn't know that then. However, I was very fortunate. I studied hard at the Sorbonne Psychology. When I came here, I studied, I got a master's in sociology at the New School for Social Research, and then a doctorate at Teachers College, Columbia University, where I'm still an adjunct associate professor. It sounds so, like you have, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. I wanted to, I, I'm gonna jump out of time a little bit here because I have some chronological questions. But it sounds like your father was a very special man. I mean, there was, no, did you have no a question. real bond with your father? Tell us a little bit about your, your father. Okay, the first thing I have to tell you, uh, every Friday night, because I was an only child, I was a girl, usually it was boys who could go to synagogue. My father took me to synagogue. He carried in the po west pocket of his suit a little money Friday night just for one ice cream on the way to synagogue. I can still taste the vanilla ice cream that I got. And then I was permitted to sit with him and listen to the other uh, people discuss and sing the songs of Shabbat. And then when he came home, he did sing to my mother, Eshet Chayel Mi a woman of valor who can find, and I have to plug one of my books, uh, Heavenly Sex. All of you listen. Heavenly Sex, Sexuality in the Jewish Tradition, NYU Press, that just became a classic. It will never be out of print. It's a paperback, and it explains why somebody like me, with that accent, short, why somebody like me, like me being so Jewish, can talk about orgasm and erection and all the things that I've talked about so openly because for us Jews, sex was never a sin. It was always an obligation of a husband towards his wife. So you will learn all about that by coming to the show, watching Tova. Tell us a little bit about your mom. My mother well, came from a village. And my mom, every letter, I have a whole folder of letters that they sent me to Switzerland until they were deported. She always said, Deine Tisch Liebende, which means your loving mother. She was not learned. My grandmother looked a little down on her because um, she got pregnant and then they had to get married. That's the way it was in those days. And she did not have any higher education, but she was a wonderful, loving mother. And the grandmother was the most important person after my father uh, in that household because she had nothing else to do but take care of me. Was this your maternal grandma or your paternal? My no, my, my father's mother. Oh, then I, okay. had, I also had uh, my mother's parents were in Wiesenfeld not far from Frankfurt, they were farmers. I went there every Jewish holiday and every holiday in the, and during the summer. Mm -hmm. And I have wonderful memories from that time in Wiesenfeld. Wiesenfeld means meadow. So tell me, so how do you get to Israel? And then when you get to Israel, so what happens? I, the, 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 <laughs> the Palestine people were clever. They sent good-looking young men to be the emissaries and to be recruiting people for Israel. <laughs> it says in the play, it says uh, that I became very much, and I'm still very much of a Zionist. I did not know that I would not stay my whole life there until the epidemic now. I went to Israel every year. I speak Hebrew fluently. I taught, I did television, I did radio. And right now I'm not traveling, but I knew that I needed to go so that Jews would have a country of their own, so that this would never happen again. So I was and still am an ardent Zionist. I happen to live in New York, but I don't complain about that because what has happened to me 
in terms of becoming known. And the New York Times today in an article said, really known. Um, <laughs> that could only happen in, in, uh, in New York. But I did a lot of programs in Hebrew in Israel. So you get to Israel and you join the Haganah. Tell us a little yeah, bit no, about your Haganah career. Right. First, I joined the kibbutz near Nahalal. And then I went to Jerusalem to study kindergarten teacher because my grandmother said I should be a kindergarten teacher. I'm so short I would fit on those little chairs. <laughs> and, and then I joined the Haganah very short period of time on June 4th. 1948, I was badly wounded on my birthday, on my 20th birthday. I was badly wounded on both legs. That's not why I'm short. I would have been short anyway. A bit from a pagaz, a cannonball that came into the Beit Achalutzot, into the girls' residence where I left, the student house. And uh, I almost lost both of my legs. But luckily, there was a brilliant surgeon from Germany, a Jewish surgeon. He fixed me so well that later uh, in Europe and, in, Fra and in, in America, I became a super skier, black diamond skier. So um, I was wounded badly, but then I continued my studies. I worked for one year with Yemeni children who had just come with a magic carpet in 1950 to uh, then Israel. And I heard Ben-Gurion declare the state of Israel from Tel Aviv while I was in Jerusalem dancing the whole night. I even danced lately with Tova. I hope when she comes I, I, that she remembers I danced with her. She's a good dancer. <laughs> um, so... While you're in Israel, you got married for the first time. And I, I want to talk to you a little bit about your marriages because All I want right, to know, what I want to know, know, I want to know why the first two did not work. Okay. Wait, and wait, then wait. I'll ask you about the third. No, wait, listen, first of all, come and see the show. Then you'll know that. However, the first two were wonderful love affairs that I legalized, but then the real marriage of so many years is Manfred Westheimer, whom I met skiing, who was a chief engineer. To my bitter regret, he passed away 20 some years ago, who was German Jewish from Karlsruhe. He was fortunate. His parents were saved because they went to Portugal. Portugal in those years accepted Jews. And then he, they sent him to the United States because they were worried that Hitler would take Portugal. And I met Fred Westheimer skiing. I had already my little girl, Miriam. He adopted her. Then we had my son, Joel. And I'm a lucky grandmother of four. And the last line, which I'll tell you, uh, 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 Moment Magazine, the last line in the play is it shows my four grandchildren. And I say that's so, I do say it in my books, Hitler lost and I won because I have four wonderful grandchildren. So I have a question. How do you know when your, your marriage is the real one and not a legalized love affair? You, you know that. You don't have to be a psychologist. You realize if you are bored, no good. Now, in those days, people did not know so much about marriage counseling. So um, maybe if I had known more, I don't know, I have no regrets because my real marriage and my thinking about it was Manfred Westheimer, German Jewish, intelligent. I picked him up on a ski slope. Please come and see the show because Tova explains it beautifully. If I were you people, Get your tickets and come to New York. <laughs> <laughs> so why did you, you could have been anything in the world. In fact, it sounds like you were many things already from a sniper to a kindergarten teacher. How did you, why, why become a psychologist? What was, because what drove you? What was driving you? 
what was driving me is yeah. to know the importance of early childhood, like what I told you before, the, the importance of growing up in a loving family. And then it was of interest because Dr. Helen Singer Kaplan was the first to write a book, The New Sex Therapy. And she was a pioneer. And I was lucky. I had a wonderful mentor at Cornell University and I worked with her for five years. It was very interesting that somebody like me, who until I had my first boyfriend, that's also in the play, come and learn about that, uh, that I wasn't touched for a few years when I left Frankfurt uh, to the uh, children's home in Switzerland. We had enough to eat, we were never hungry, but there was no, no real um, emotional love. So the first boyfriend with whom I'm still friends, who lives in Haifa, I still talk to him, I see him every time I go to Israel. If you want to know more about him, come to see the show. Okay. <laughs> um, so um, you worked at Planned Parenthood yes. when you were a young woman in New York. What did you learn in Planned Parenthood? I learned the importance of people making decisions because some of them did get pregnant without wanting to be pregnant. So this was my main emphasis to work. I trained paraprofessionals to be family planning counselors and to uh, make sure that everybody knew about contraception if they did have sex and didn't want to be pregnant. This was a wonderful way for me to talk about family life, to talk about relationships, and to talk about people having to know what to do in order not to be, uh, not to have an unintended pregnancy. So you are a psychologist now at this point in your life. When did you, what day, what night, what morning did you become Dr. Ruth? When did you suddenly like transform from, you know, your everyday, really smart, hardworking, driven New York psychologist to suddenly becoming Dr. Ruth? Right. Because there was an offer to address uh, radio managers on the need for sexuality education because they all had to have community affairs programs. There was no fear attached to it. So nobody else wanted to go. I said, right away I go. And I told them, here is a sociological term. I told them what you are is significant others. You moment magazine writers and you editor and you readers are also what is called significant others because you're getting knowledge to give to other people. I said, you people are significant others, a sociological term. You ought to have a program on the air about contraception and about issues of sexuality. I did not think I would do it. Listen to my accent. However, they gave me 15 minutes. I did it for one year, every Sunday night. Then I did 10 years, two hours every Sunday night. Fred Westheimer came down with me to Rockefeller Center. I did my program. I did answer letters. I signed them on. Uh, sometimes I meet people, they show me the letter that I signed 20 years ago. So um, that's how slowly, slowly, there was a t-shirt never on Sunday about sex. And um, I had a wonderful career. Then I had a big career, and you have to see that in the play, a big career on television, like David Letterman, like Johnny Carson, like uh, all of the big shots I had on my program. My producer was John Lolos. I did like hundreds of television programs with him, and we are still good friends. Well, let me, let me ask you something that I think a lot about. What's the role of honesty in a relationship and in a romantic relationship. 
Only Moment Magazine can ask a question like this. Listen oh, okay. carefully. <laughs> Listen carefully, all of you, Moment Magazine. Never mind honesty. Don't ever tell a partner your penis is so small. My last lover had a bigger penis. Don't ever tell a woman. I really like big breasts when your partner right now has small breasts. Never mind honesty. Honesty, throw it out of the window as of this morning, listening to me. Honesty has to be intelligent. It has to be productive. It has to be something that you can change. Nobody can change the size of penis. Loud and clear, penis size has nothing to do with the sexual satisfaction of a woman. And breast size has nothing to do with the satisfaction of, uh, of, of a woman. So careful what you say. I do not believe in this total honesty. Nonsense. Next question. Okay. You, you have some questions from the audience. Well, I have a few more questions here. Right. Um, so what do you, I guess there's another question. Why is sex so important to a relationship? Can you have a perfectly good marriage Anybody? and not have sex? Definitely not. Next question. Okay. <laughs> you want to give us more details on that? No. The no? only okay. thing I want to say, whoever has a problem, and there are problems. Sometimes it's a physical problem. When I saw a man and he said that he has difficulties obtaining and maintaining an erection, he first had to go to a urologist to see that there's nothing physical. I'm not a medical doctor. If any woman said to me, she has pain during intercourse, which means there was not enough lubrication. Before I gave her another appointment, she had to see a gynecologist because there might have been something physical. When she came back to me with a letter, nothing physical wrong, I could do sex therapy. When he came back that the urologist said nothing wrong, I could do sex therapy. You had to be very careful of ruling out anything that somebody like me, not being a medical person, could not know about. So, so listening to your life, I, you have incredible resiliency. And I'm wondering, where does that resiliency come from? Okay, so the resiliency comes from that early childhood. I see Tova. Hi, Tova. Before I answer, before I answer that, Tova, you are fabulous. I saw you now in every performance. I'm coming again and again. Tell Moment Magazine to come and see you. You are brilliant. You are every time you get better. Did you get my flowers? I got your flowers and I wrote you a thank you note, but it's in snail mail. I have them. Okay, it'll get to me. Thank you. Okay. I love your flowers. They were huge. It's a huge bouquet. It's with me in my dressing room. It's in That's my... what I want it to be. And you were brilliant. Okay, back to that question. So where does... So, Tova, we're going to get to you in a second. So... Um, where does your resiliency come from? Your early okay. childhood? Yeah, resilience. Tell us, because you are, resiliency is a really important skill and yes. so many of us kind of forget it. And okay. how, do we, how do we be resilient? Okay, resiliency is, happens when you believe in something that you are doing very strongly. And then you have to say to yourself, never mind the criticism, never mind people to say, you shouldn't talk like that on on the air. Uh, I had the guts and the chutzpah. Moment magazine, put that word down loud and clear. Chutzpah, the nerve to talk about those things that other people didn't talk about because I believe in the importance of that. That's where I'm getting the resiliency and that's why I'm getting all of this uh, accolades of that I'm resilient. That's true. I'm four foot seven. I'm, I'm losing a little bit of height, not too much because otherwise you're not going to see me anymore. Um, but I certainly am still having the real chutzpah and the resiliency of talking about those things that I believe in. And okay. I'll talk to Tova. I am going to talk to Tova. Give me one more. I'm going to just finish this one question and then we're moving over to Tova. 
So, and I'm going to ask Tovi this too later, but so how do you live your life? You have lived your life to the fullest. You have, and you're still living your life to the fullest. And it's so amazing and inspirational. So what's your advice to everybody else? How do we live our lives to the fullest? Okay. The first thing is never to retire, only to rewire, number one. Number two, find something that is of real interest to you. It doesn't have to be sex. Sex is the most interesting subject, but it doesn't have to be sex. It can be anything else. And develop that, take some courses, develop that, stop complaining. All of us have complaints. All of us have difficulties being at home and not seeing loved ones and all of the other things. I know all about that. I give people the opportunity to talk about it half a minute. And then I want to talk with them about something productive. Volunteer, do something for others. Do something, it doesn't have to be Jewish. It can be anything. It can be for Afghanistan women these days. It can be anything that you believe in and do develop that. Make sure that you talk a lot on the phone. <laughs> I talk, Tova plays it beautifully. I never had a telephone in, in, in Palestine, Israel. Nobody had a telephone. I never had a telephone in Paris. I was a poor student. So I thought when I did market research, I thought I have to shout. I still shout. I still think that you can't hear me if I don't shout. So you people, one phone call to somebody whom you haven't talked to in a long time. Not about the misery, not about the loneliness, not about the uh, terrible thing with the virus, but about something positive. That's my advice for the day. Tova, you agree? But I totally, I totally agree. Of course, I don't even have to speak. Just let her do my interview. <laughs> well, now what ask, Tova, ask Tova how it is to play this little Dr. Ruth. I have seen you ask that, her. Wait, Where I want it? to tell You're you something. Be me. You be me right now. Yeah. Yeah, I want to tell you something. <laughs> Tova did uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Tova did Golda Meir. Guess what? I'm in very good company. Now, Tova has a book. She will talk to you about her book. However, she now has to write a new book because I'm not in that book. <laughs> because she did publish that book. It's a beautiful book. Please get it. And it's even signed at the museum by Tova. My book is there too, but my book is not important right now. Tova's is important. Tova, another book where I'm one of the roles that you play. Goodbye. <laughs> yes, and you have to write a book where I'm in your book. I'm not in any of your book. Deborah Jo Rupp is in your book, but I'm not in your book because we didn't have this part when we were both published. So, there so, we go. so why don't you tell me, why, Tova, why don't you tell me how you two actually met the first time? Have you known each other? I've known, I've known Tova for a long time. I've known Dr. Ruth for a while. How did you two meet each other? You know, honestly, it's been such a while I don't fully remember. I would hope that Ruth came to see my work because I don't know. Did you ever see Yentl, 1975? No, I, don't know. I, did, I did not have money for theater and I didn't know Patty Kenner yet who, who gets tickets. <laughs> <laughs> Tell her that we, we, we her all know Patty. <laughs> <laughs> I, met, so, I, met, I met Patty Kenner, who's a great philanthropist and an extraordinary. And a friend um, to all of us here in this, on this. Yeah, she's a mix Coincidentally. Family. She's one big mitzvah machine, but I met her on the ski slopes of Aspen and had Ruth and my paths crossed earlier, we would have skied together. I would have had to follow her down the mountain. I don't think. I would not have shared the good looking ski instructors with you. Oh. The good looking ski instructors I kept for myself. I'm sure. So if I would find some old one, but I know your husband and well, and, and not, I was sitting next to him at the performance in the Hamptons. And she was at the, she was, you were at Amanda's wedding and Amanda's married seven years today. So and I, I was dancing 
and I was dancing at the wedding and I probably stayed until the last dance. You did. You stayed till 2 a.m. It was <laughs> Let me ask you, Nadine, so, said the actress, we're just recording this or are we on camera? We are on camera and we have uh, 613 people with us. 613 is a very special number. Actually, it's a couple less now, but so we are, you were on, you were on stage. Well, I'm thrilled so. and in honor of Dr. Ruth and, and becoming Dr. Ruth. I'd like you to know this is the first interview I've given from my bed. I'm in bed because I'm preparing for, I am on vocal rest to be careful. The play is very um, demanding. Demanding. Uh, mm -hmm. Very demanding. And it's an honor to do it. I have to say, you know, you ask an actor, what is their favorite role? And each role is like a different child. Your job is to love your roles, big, small. You're on the tennis court with that part. And then instead of hitting the ball back and forth to the part, you get on the same side of the net and mm -hmm. you become one seamless person. But I do have to say from the heart that playing Ruth has affected my life more than any other part I've ever played. And that's saying a lot because I've, I, this is my 50th year in equity and my 48th year making films and television in the sense that her advice is so salubrious. It's so healthful. It's so positive. It's, it builds longevity or the illusion of it. It builds um, PMA, positive mental attitude. And it's even affected my wonderful 45 year marriage. Let me tell you, Andy goes to see the show and the first thing he wants to do is make love when we get home. So it's great. <laughs> it's just been a wonderful, positive experience that I hope to continue. As Ruth has said, we want to move this show. We want to go from the museum to at least off Broadway and spend time in New York. This is the city of my birth. This is my hometown. And uh, I want to share uh, not just Ruth's story. You see, it goes deeper than that. It goes into the river of universal human experience of what are, our, what are our choices in life? I mean, we can choose to complain, to see the glass half empty, to uh, to judge, to judge, that's, that's a big one, to arrest judgment. The Jewish mind is often taught that its brilliance lies in its critical abilities. I take exception to that as, as a senior citizen. Mm -hmm. I say, you want to discuss the Talmud, you can argue yourself, you know, uh, for hours, go do what you want. But in life, be for things. Be the man on the street. There was a man lying on Chambers Street as I was taking the subway down to the show. And I did call the police. I mean, there's a guy lying on the pavement, for God's sakes. Don't leave him there. As Ruth Bader Ginsburg say, if you say, if you stay silent, when there is injustice, you have joined the opposition. Mm -hmm. And I think that that, that, is, that is a very uh, Im important moral um, fiber to, to, to stand by. In doing this play, I've had to read, I've chosen, I've chosen to read Ruth's books. And they're fabulous because they never give up on life. They never give up. And I agree with her, do not retire, do what you love if you, if you love your work, your work is your longevity. Your work is your tikkun. Your work is your higher purpose. So I'm a transformational actor. That's my job. My job is to conjure up in your minds that you're looking at Ruth Westheimer. Now, there's only one Ruth Westheimer, but I can tell her story and have been trained to tell her story for two thirds of my life. So I make choices that she may not have made, but the audience will it will impinge on the audience and give them variety and a way to look at her in maybe ways they've never seen her before. So it's it's just great being with you, Ruth. And I'm with her seven times a week and during rehearsal. I'm obsessed with Ruth with Ruth Westheimer. And I'm obsessed with you. <laughs> so how well, do you to Tova, how do you how do you uh transform yourself into Dr. Ruth every day? You're getting you. You take the subway to the theater, to the to the museum where the show is, and you put on your costume and you put on your makeup. What do you What do you do inside? What do you say to yourself? What do you think? <clears throat> First of all, when I go to the subway, which I enjoy, I really enjoy it when it works. It doesn't work on the weekend so well. 
but it works very well. And I take my share of Ubers, particularly when I'm under her care, because she won't let me take the subway at night. <laughs> I didn't permit it. I made you take an Uber. I know. She did. She not only made me pay, she made the, she not only made me take it, she made the museum pay for it. It was hilarious. I certainly did. I do it again. <laughs> so <clears throat> I, first of all, I go to the subway in my hiking boots. Why? Because Ruth is a hiker. So I wear the shoes that she may have had in her lifetime. I go in my ski jacket because Ruth was a skier. I wear my ski hat. I dress like an athlete. <clears throat> First of all, I am an athlete, and I assume Ruth was a very good athlete. If you're a good sharpshooter and you're a good messenger and you're a good runner and you're a good swimmer, which I am a great swimmer, I swim a mile a day when I'm when I can get a hold of a pool, and I will begin that again after opening night. But we're mm -hmm. so we're just completely immersed in in shining this show up, and boy, this show is magical. I invite all of you to see it. The stage at the Museum of Jewish Heritage is very expanded. And the lights that we have <clears throat> bought and rented, both for the hall and we brought in extra lights, are exquisite. So the, the set doesn't look just accurate, it looks magical. It it's, looks magical. I second the motion, it's beautiful. It's the best set I've ever seen. Exactly, I, I really think so. And also, this is my third shot at this part. I was streamed in California. I had 15 days of rehearsal, barely anything. I think two, uh, you know, 15 days of rehearsal. And then I went on film in California. Then I called Scott, who is my muse. I did Golda with him, The Prompter, Arsenic and Old Lace, and now Becoming Dr. Ruth. And I said, look, I've got a play for you. I already know the lines, but I need to retool certain parts of the play. Would you do this with me? And he did, and we were a great success in Bay Street. And then the, we raised the money to come into New York, which was, you know, a few hundred thousand dollars. We raised it very, very well and fairly darn quickly. And uh, the museum opened its arms, which was Ruth's stream. And the uh, Safra Hall is so elegant. The whole museum is so elegant. The bathrooms are beautiful. The coat check is pristine. Let me tell you, I've played a lot of off-Broadway houses and Broadway houses and were much more beat up <laughs> near 42nd Street. So the whole experience has been extraordinary, and I look forward to going to work at night. I just have to make sure hee, 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 that I can have my vocal uh, uh, virtuosity. Mm -hmm. I have to be very uh, have, mindful of my voice. Can you give us one or two lines as Dr. Ruth? Give us a touch. Well, what I want to say is that Dr. Ruth is so, so optimistic that the ends of her sentences, even the ends of her sentences, go up. And she's very, very funny. She's very funny. She had great guests on her television show. Uh, Joan Rivers came on and she said she had her greatest orgasms walking into Saks Fifth Avenue and saying, charge it. <laughs> so here's a little bit of Dr. Ruby. <laughs> that sounds wonderful. Um, <laughs> so do you want to just tell us a little bit about how, like, did the two of you talk about this idea to do this play? How did it get started? No, the play is old, the play is ah. nine years older. Mark St. Germain, I know there's a story she saw a, 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 a play about Freud that Mark had written and then Mark wanted to write about Ruth and at first she said no, then she met Mark and she said yes because Mark St. Germain is a saint. He's a marvelous person. He's a fantastic collaborator. He has rewritten parts of the script for us on our request and God bless him for that because we feel we have improved the manuscript. I fully believe that. Mm -hmm. And uh, and the proof of the pudding is in the audience. So, you know, when you're in New York, lovely doesn't work, Nadine. If it ain't an A, it's an F. That's the way it goes. You have 110 things to see a night. Things that are lovely and are a B, they just, bye, they just fade. So you really have to hit the bullseye the way that Ruth was a sharpshooter. And there's a way to do that. You cut out all that which is not brilliant in a script. And that which is underwritten, you have to elucidate. And he has been very cooperative because he's co cooperated with a new set of eyes, mine and Scott's. He's been very, very kind. Mm -hmm. And um, we're still working on the play. We have rehearsal at uh, 2 o'clock today, 2 to 4. We have rehearsal every day until we open. Yeah. And what day do you open again? We open December 16th, but the critics start coming uh, next Sunday, December 12th, 13th, 14th, and 15th. We have the press. It sounds like you can see both of you at the show, you on stage and Dr. Ruth in it's the audience. A, we have a big Q&A on uh, December 8th, 
December 15th and December 22nd with Ruth there. So I welcome all, all of you. I mean, I ain't chopped liver either. You can buy tickets just to see me, but she will be there as well on the 8th, which is this Wednesday, the 15th, the 22nd. And of course, she'll be there opening night, the 16th, and there's still tickets available. And my children will be there. And my grandchildren will be yes. there. Yes, yes. And if I write a sequel to Lilyville, I wrote a, a memoir about my life as seen through my mother's eyes, who lived to, all, to over 103, and uh, my mother's life as seen through my eyes. It's about the child-parent relationship. Mm -hmm. If I write a sequel to Lilyville, I'll probably just call it Ruthville or Quellsville. <laughs> I'm going to Quellsville. Ruthville is Quellsville. <laughs> well, I also want to say that Tova did something really wonderful. I just did a book. I collaborated on a book with uh, Justice Ginsburg, just Ruth Bader Ginsburg, and she read the she reads the audio version of it, which is just wonderful. Mm -hmm. So she has another Ruth in her life too, who she's also played. Well, but this is this is the Ruth of the moment, and I'm very, very thrilled to be in the presence and in Ruth Westheimer's universe, or Carola, Carola Ruth Siegel Westheimer. And Westheimer. tell everybody that you are a brilliant actress. <laughs> every time I sit there and I enjoy every minute of it. Thank you. I was there yesterday too. I know. I... And you saw the president of Rutgers University. Jonathan Holloway. My friend, my friend from, with his wife, my friend from Yale, go ahead. No, wonderful. Um, I am noticing, because I wasn't paying attention because I'm talking to you both for so chance fixing, but we have so many questions. And I wanted to see if, Suzanne, would you like to ask, have people choose a few questions that we can, uh, sure, we can we're ask? Only gonna, we're only gonna have time for a couple because I know Dr. Ruth, you have to go to a radio interview yes, I do. Uh, in a few minutes. Um, but first of all, both of you, thank you so much. That was wonderful. Uh, Dr. Ruth, I do wanna let you know, several people have written in saying they've bumped into you onto the slopes before uh, skiing <laughs> and, and that made their day. Um, That's a <laughs> Dr. Ruth, someone would like to know, um, how does your Judaism inform your outlook today? Okay, very fast, that in the Jewish tradition, sex has always been an obligation of a husband to a wife, never a sin. That's why I could be talking publicly so well about issues of sexuality, because I'm very Jewish, and that everybody who has that question go and get the book, Heavenly Sex, Sexuality in the Jewish Tradition, New York University Press, a classic now. Great. Tova, the same question for you. Repeat the question. How does your Judaism inform your outlook on life today? I think Judaism is a very practical religion. I think one of the greatest things about it is that you don't have to be a deist to be a good Jew, but you do have to do mitzvahs. You have to do deeds of loving kindness. So therefore, the religion, the, the, the ethnicity of Judaism is accessible to many people in many different ways. If it doesn't get you with God, it gets you with, with mitzvahs. If it doesn't get you with mitzvahs, it gets you with latkes. It has, a, <laughs> it, it has a, a food tradition. It has a song tradition, a dance tradition. And how many people have the privilege of feeling that they're a member of a club that's 5,000 years old? I mean, that's... Mm -hmm an extraordinary legacy and heritage. And it's very cozy. I'm very proud to be a Jew. I think that in many ways, New York City is Jewish. You come in as a Christian or any other religion, you end up as a Jew because the values are Jewish. The values of excellence, erudition, trying your best, keeping your word, uh, trying to be decent. The great thing about New York is if somebody's lying in the street, they're not lying over there, they're lying right in front of your face. So what are you going to do about it? What are you going to do? So uh, that's it. I'm changing my name from Terry Sue, which is my birth name, Terry Sue Felchie, to Tova was uh, something that changed the whole landscape of my life. And I didn't do it for political or religious reasons. I did it for love of a person who wasn't even Jewish. And what happened is that my tikkun showed up very, very quickly. Mm -hmm. So people assumed I was expert in things I was not expert in, but they gifted me with roles that were that were absolutely um, stunning and 
resulted in the spiraling of my career. The, the, the Jewish heroine, whether it was Yentl, Helena Slomova and Holocaust, Golda Meir, um, Vivian Gornick's play, and of course, RBG, and now, Dr. Ruth Westheimer. Yes. And That's on, me. <laughs> <laughs> and on that note, unfortunately, we are going to have to close. As I said, Dr. Ruth has another interview, um, I but I want to thank you if you need me. I can stay for a few minutes, but I don't know if your, okay. your Zoom runs out. At no, we, 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 we can stay for a few more minutes with you, but I wanted to just thank you both. Thank you, Dr. Ruth, uh, for you. joining us. Um, I want to let people know that the play uh, does run at the museum until January 2nd. Uh, fingers crossed it moves on to Broadway after that. Uh, and you can get tickets for that online. Um, I will be sending a follow-up email that will have a link um, and the titles of both of their uh, books and as well as a link to the museum and I'll also include a link to uh, a program we did with Tova on her book Lilyville back in uh, March which was just wonderful. Uh, so Dr. Ruth I'm sorry you have to leave us but thank you so much for joining us. I look forward to be coming up to see the show in a few weeks. Okay make sure I meet you. Absolutely. Tova good luck. Watch your voice Tova. I will. Uh, no hi to everybody, to Amanda and everybody else. Bye. Bye, Bye. Dr. Ruth. Love to join me. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. <clears throat> So, uh, Nadine, if you want to finish, uh, have some more conversation with Tova, and then I can hop back on and ask some questions. We have to, oh, but did you have also some more? I think there were also questions in here about. Um, so, um, what about, are there any questions? Are there any other questions? There were a lot of, yeah, there were a lot of questions, but I guess I was going to ask you, um, where does your thirst for performing come from? Is it, is it connected with your Judaism in some way? No. No? My thirst for performance comes from my father. He was a litigator, and I applied to Harvard Law School and made the wait list. And then I won a scholarship in acting to the Tyrone mm -hmm. Guthrie Theater in Minneapolis, Minnesota. I was a McKnight Fellow, and um, <clears throat> we, I did, my parts were so small that I did 11 parts. I think, no, I had 22 roles. <clears throat> Pardon me. I had 22 roles in six plays. I would come on as an actress, exit, come on as a boy poet, exit, come on as a nun. I had about three parts of play. It was hilarious. And uh, I... Uh, if you read Lilyville, you'll see how the career was birthed. It very much was a manifestation of um, substituting for mother love, uh, audience love. Mm -hmm. And I was successful at it. And I was successful at getting my, my, communicating with my mother as well. She lived till 103, as I mentioned before. And as a result, we were able to bower our two trees together. We were very intertwined for the last two decades of her life. And it was very satisfying for me and very fulfilling. I feel completely complete with my mother. But when I was a little girl, she wasn't a big talker. She was quiet. And uh, I felt a lack of support, which I probably didn't have, but she never said, you lo I love you. So that was difficult for me to interpret. And as a result, uh, I went after my father's love, which I had in space. He was very emotionally expressive and <clears throat> I took litigating to another place. I didn't, I said, well, I won't be a lawyer and write my own scripts in a courtroom, but I will do plays, maybe even about law, like Law and Order. I was on one episode and Dick Wolf kept me for 13 years. He said, well, that kid knows what she's doing. As a litigator, of course, because I was brought up around my dad. So I used to watch him in the courts. It was thrilling. Is there a different process for becoming <clears throat> Golda Meir or for becoming Ruth Bader Ginsburg or becoming <clears throat> Dr. Ruth? Or is it the same process? Tell us a little bit about that process. Well, I mean, the actor, particularly if, if the person's an historical figure, you have, a, you have an obligation to do your research. So I, with Golda, I, for the off-Broadway run, obviously I live in New York where she went through to get to the Eretz. And I also went to visit Milwaukee. <laughs> where her a a accent comes from, Baruch Adonai, and on to Denver. But the way between the Broadway, off-Broadway and Broadway run, we ran to Israel, Kiev. I, I covered every step that she touched. And I had been to the Soviet Union <clears throat> myself as a student. 
So I just went back there. Uh, I didn't have to go back there at that time. Um, with Ruth Westheimer, there is, first of all, she's alive. So the most important thing is to expose myself to her and to the details of her life that might not be in the play. So Ruth wrote certain li lines in this play. Now she didn't know she was writing them, but when I go visit her and she said, my parents gave me life twice, once when they yeah. gave birth to me and once when they sent me to safety in Switzerland, that line went right into the script with Mark's permission, but that wasn't in the script. So um, the process, <clears throat> again, the principle of the process is the same. It's research and it's practice to be accurate, excellent, effortless. That's the key. So for instance, when I first started to do the play, it was much more difficult to talk like this. It's a, I can now improvise like this. It is not a problem. I do not have the veins sticking out in my neck or anything like that. And um, it is very easy and uh, inspiring to talk like a person who is constantly choosing, choosing to be an optimist, choosing happiness. These are choices. These are choices. That's wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Tova. And I know you actually have to go rest up too, because you have till two o'clock. At two o'clock, you have to be at the I, theater. I do. My secretary's got to get done and get and ready for my opening night notes. So, and yeah. I'm looking forward to seeing the play too. It sounds just fabulous. I can't wait. Suzanne, thank you for inviting me. Thank you, Nadine, so much. And I am, I'm sorry to have been a few minutes late. I was in the steam. You room. made your, you made your debut just in time. You just, you showed you up just in time. You knew your, you knew the timing was perfect. That's great. I know Ruth Good. likes, uh, has many valuable things to say and can do so on her own. <laughs> so again, Tova, thank you. We want to thank the audience for joining us. A reminder um, to buy tickets for Becoming Dr. Ruth in New York at the museum. Um, again, I will send a link for that as well as uh, Tova's book, Lilyville and Nadine's book, um, RBG's Brave and Brilliant Women. Uh, again, I want to remind people to go to Moment's website at momentmag.com to register for tomorrow's Zoominar, which is Shedding Light on Domestic Violence, and ne next week's program on the week. Uh, uh, again, thank you, and we will see everybody next time. Take care. Bye, Bye Tava. Bye, Bye, everybody. Bye, Bye.